Welcome back to my beginning TDD series. Let's start off this video with a new test method that ensures that our list of T implementation removes all elements from the inner array when clear is called. I therefore use the list builder that we created in the last video to initialize the test target. Afterwards I call clear and then I use the assert empty method to ensure that my collection contains no more items. Finally I create some test data for it so that this test is run several times. Please notice that the second test set entry checks that clear is called on an empty list of t. The tests fail of course and being the devil's advocate I try to provide the simplest implementation possible. In this case I just set count to zero and this lets all my tests pass. And I commit my code as I don't want to refactor anything. In the next iteration, I do not want to write a new test, but merely change the way test methods are displayed in the Visual Studio's Test Explorer. I therefore add an application configuration file and add the key value pair for xunit method display set to true. xunit.net is highly configurable and you can find a link on this topic in the descriptions down below. But back to the clear method of our list of t implementation. This method is currently not implemented correctly and might lead to memory leaks because the internal array keeps references to objects when it is used with the reference type. These references are kept until another element is stored in a corresponding position, as you can see in this diagram showing what might happen at runtime on the heap. I therefore write a new method that uses a weak reference to an object to verify that it is gone from memory when the garbage collector runs. In this method I call clear on the sud and afterwards run gccollect to start the garbage collector. Finally I try to retrieve the object through the weak reference which must not be possible. This leads me to the functionality that I have to assign default of t to all positions in the array when I call clear. Please note that although this test passes in Visual Studio 2015 CTP5 and 6, this test fails in debug mode in Visual Studio 2013 update 4 with .NET 4.5.2 installed. I couldn't find out why this is happening, but if you know why, you can answer my corresponding Stack Overflow question, you can find the link in the descriptions. But back to writing more tests. The next TDD iteration is not very interesting because I just ensure that the initial capacity of my list must be 4. This test is so easy that I quickly run through this part of the video. But the next iteration is more interesting again. I want to write a test for the index of method. This test initializes the test target with items as we've seen so often and uses an item that is being searched for with the index of method. The returned index is then compared to the expected index, which is also passed in as a parameter from the test data. Being the devil's advocate, I implement the index of method initially with a call to object equals. But I recall that item could be null and thus my call would fail with a null reference exception. Therefore I enhance my test data with a new entry so that I call equals with null. This of course leads to the test failing in this run. To solve the problem I create an extension method called compare with hash code and equals that encapsulates the whole process of comparing two items with each other. First I check if source is null. If that's the case I can immediately return true if other is also null. If other is not null I can call equals on that instance to let the corresponding implementation decide here. Because I'll pass through the first if block return, I'm sure that after this very block source is not null. And in turn I can call the equals method on source if other would be null. If neither of these conditions apply, I'm certain that source and other are not null. Thus I can call get hash code on both of them to provide a fast check if they could be equal. If both hash codes are the same, I can call equals to do the final check. Please note that I respect the rules of get hash code and equals here. If the hash codes of two objects are different, then they cannot be equal. 
On the other side, if their hash codes are the same, the objects might still be not equal, but may have just produced the same hash code, which is why equals has to be called in this case. I run my tests and all of them pass now, but I'm not confident enough that my extension method is correct and thus I write own tests for it. In the first test, I merely want to check if get hash code is called on both parameters when they are not null. To ensure that get hash code gets called on an instance, I have to track this. I therefore create a so-called mock object that I use for these test scenarios. In the class called equality mock, I override the equals and get hash code method. The values that are returned by this method can be passed in via constructor injection. This allows me to configure instances with different behavior in my tests. For that very reason, I changed the fact to a theory to use two differently configured equality mocks to call compare with hash code and equals with. The most important part comes now. I add the functionality to the equality mock class so that it tracks the number of calls to the equals and get hash code method. This is just done via simple automatic integer properties that hold the call count of the corresponding method. I now incorporate this mock into my tests and therefore check if these methods get called exactly once. But I notice that my test data is actually not suitable for this scenario. I therefore transform the test to only check if get hash code gets called, which in the end is the important thing that I want to ensure. But let's have a more abstract look at the stuff we were doing here. In this case, we created the new class equality mock that we use only for testing purposes. You can see that we didn't use the public API of the SUT to validate its correctness. And that is why this test is not a triangulation test as we've learned before. Instead, we use the information of the equality mock instances to check if our SUT called our methods within the tested functionality correctly. And this is why equality mock is a so-called test double. Test doubles can be used to replace certain or all dependencies of the SUT with special functionality that often mimics a certain behavior. Usually these doubles are injected into the SUT because the latter programs against its dependencies via some sort of abstraction, usually interfaces, so that the underlying implementation can be easily exchanged. There are different forms of test doubles and we'll briefly discuss all of them now. A so-called dummy can be called by the SUT but doesn't actually do anything useful and is also not used to track information for the test. Thus I would see a dummy just like a null object. Its main purpose of existence is so that a certain call of the SUT does not produce a null reference exception in most cases. A stub, on the other hand, is a test double that can be called by the system under test like the dummy, but it also returns a value to the SUT. These return values can be hard coded, or you write configurable stubs where the return values are injected, usually through the constructor. A stub usually is not complex. A spy is an object that can be called by the SUT and that tracks call information. The spy is then normally used in the assert phase to ensure that a specific method was called by the test target for a certain number of times. A mock is a combination of a spy and a stub. It tracks call information and returns values back to the SUT. And this is why I called the test double equality mock, because it returns a value for the equals and get hash code calls, as well as tracking the number of call counts to these methods. The purest form of a mock also has a method that throws an exception when a certain call was not performed by the test target. I didn't use this in my tests, but if you look at the code of a mock, you can usually find these verification methods on them. Finally, there are fakes, and these are mimics of real complex components or third-party systems that are usually not used in the assert phase of the test. A good example of a fake is an in-memory database that might be used in integration tests to speed up the time it takes to execute all tests. Now that you know the different kinds of test doubles, I want to discuss the role of mocks and spies in more detail. Both of them track information about calls to the dependencies of the SUT 
that you use in the assert phase. If you incorporate these into a test, then you write a so-called behavior verification test. In them, you do not make assertions using the public API of the SUT, but instead use mocks or spies for this purpose. With this information, we can safely say that our last test is a behavior verification test. But let's jump back to the second test we wrote in this video. In it, we used a weak reference to check if references to items are removed correctly when clear is called on our test target. But this poses the following question. Is this a behavior verification or triangulation test? In my opinion, this is not completely clear as the weak reference is not injected into the test target and therefore it is not a test double in any case. On the other hand, we do not use the public API of the test target in the assert phase and therefore I would say that this test is rather a behavior verification than a triangulation. But I hope you can see that the odds are not that clear in this circumstance. But let's finish off this video with a triangulation test, checking that the correct result is returned when compare with hash code and equals is called. While writing this test method, I also removed the last assert statements in the previous test because I explicitly test this in the new test method. Finally, I commit my changes to the repository when all tests pass. In this video, you learned about test doubles and the different forms they can take. Spies and mocks stand out because you can use them to check if the SUT did actually call certain methods or raise certain events during a test. These kinds of tests are called behavior verification tests and please note that they are more tightly coupled to the implementation of your production code because you test what's happening inside a method. Furthermore, you need to set up spies or mocks. Thus, in my opinion, these kinds of tests take a longer time to write. If you have the option to write a triangulation or behavior verification test, then I would advise you to go for the former most times. Although there are obviously circumstances where behavior verification tests are more useful or even necessary. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again in the next one. Bye!